And just like a little preface, I think we're going to go into some concepts just quickly. And we're not going to have time to go through all the details of how they all work. So hopefully, you take it that way and try to provide some resources for you to take home and look at later as well if they're interesting. My name is Quentin Stainarts. I'm an attorney at Greater Boston Legal Services. During the day and at night, I run the legal consulting, one of the only DAC assemble only consulting companies. We met the last um, half a year, a little bit longer. And um, that's something I do with a, another partner, Jason Morris, who couldn't be here today because he's still at ICAIL in Montreal, where I was earlier this week. So the topic of my session today is what, what can we do to help when we're designing larger doc assembled interviews? So that's something that I've done a fair amount of now. One of the projects that, is, that I've worked on is GBLS.org, what, what can we do now? which is an addiction defense tool, which covers about, I think, it's like 40,000 lines of YAML. Um, and I feel like I've learned a lot over the last couple of years to help you design interviews that you can maintain and that are um, that will work in using best practices to help you do that. So why do we really care about this topic? What's important about doing it? One is so you can write that you can actually understand the actual If you're writing 30,000 lines of code, you can't keep all of them in your head at once. And there is going to be a time where you have to go back and put something here before. Another reason to use some of these techniques is just to make your work faster, to speed up the development process as you're going through it. And of course, make it look easier. But does it matter all the time? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that it's fine to go in and just write something quick and not to have all these principles in mind. You don't necessarily have to go to the years when you started. But I want you to have them in um, there as tools when you do start to get into something a little bit more complex. I think that one of the things to remember, of course, right, as Donald said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. You don't necessarily have to adopt all the best practice techniques before they actually become necessary to your work. Here are five that I want to talk to you about in a little bit more depth. We're talking about managing flow control, so how the interview proceeds from one topic to the next. Coding styles, something I want to touch on a little bit. Thinking about separating the interview files into different chunks. What's the right way to do that? Think about that. Using the right editor. So sometimes that's going to be the playground, but there's other editors that you choose. I'll show you a little bit more about one of the editors that I like to use. And then the next is object oriented principles, object oriented. So that's a big topic. And I don't think that um, you have to understand everything about what object oriented programming is to take advantage of how it works. So I'm going to show you a little bit about some of the benefits that you have to use. So, You've probably all written some docs and interviews where you're making use of 20 mandatory code blocks. You might be using the need uh, statement in order to, um, to help you lead into the next block. And I want to just think about think for a minute about some other approaches that you could take to do that. So this is the term spaghetti. I'm going to refer to the term spaghetti code. Some people refer to that. Yeah. Um, and just another example of this is this flow chart that um, some of you may have seen that John Mayer put on Twitter uh, several months ago. Uh, this is actually I stole from Toby Gravity's slide that we had done a different presentation put together. When you have a, a flow chart approach to your interview, which is what you're basically building, many mandatory code blocks using need to kind of say, oh, this depends on this one, you can kind of get a process map that looks like this, where it's really hard to see where you are and um, when you want to change something about the logic, it's very difficult to do that. So what I recommend instead is taking the approach of having one place where you control all of the logic of your interview. The best place to do that is a mandatory code block. You want to give that code block a unique ID. And I'm not going to show you an example of what that is right now. Um, and I think in that control block, you're going to mostly only want to be using very simple branching logic. So if question, if, else if, followed up by the variables that you want to have in order. And the advantage of that is that you can look in one place in your interview file and see exactly 
the whole logic of your interview. You don't have to go through and to line 12,000 to see uh, what the next thing is going to happen. It also lets you easily change the order of questions. So when you want to make revisions to the structure of your interview file, that's something to do. And it lets you test questions easily, too. So when you have that really complex interview flow, and you want to test the question that's 30 screens in later, when you have that one mandatory code block, you're able to, to manipulate the order temporarily to test the question that you want to work with that minute and see if the change you made took effect the way you wanted to. So I, I have, um, I know that's a little dense, so again, I just want to get you the, the flavor of some of these ideas. And on um, this link, I put together some more resources. I think I'm going to go back and add some more over time. That will help you understand a little bit of what that is, including some, some model values. I think if we have time, we can jump into this as well. So this topic was touched on. How do we deal with coding style? Questions. How do we decide how to um, decide which area we're going to use? How are we going to organize the structure of a document? There are a couple of things that I think are really important for good coding style in larger dot symbol interviews. One is I, when I am building a large interview, I label each question with an ID. That's an optional feature that you may or may not have already run into. But the basic concept here is that. Um, you just say ID and then whatever name you like after that. That's part of the question that's kind of invisible metadata that's not displayed to the end user. I also recommend using the variable name standards. Those are very small right now, but those are starting to grow. And also to use comments throughout. Not every question needs a comment, but if there's something that you're doing that's complicating the code block or some, some reminder you want to give to yourself. Again, you're thinking about your future self as well as someone else who might be reading your code. Use your time there to help say what, what you're doing and why. The ID tags allow you to tag the blocks, and that lets you find the questions you need. So say you have that really large YAML file and you're trying to find the question that you've been working on. It's something that can be consistent. It's not shown to the user, so you're not necessarily going to have to change that over time. So it's a way for you to jump to the place in the interview file that you need to work on at that moment. It's something that's needed for Google Analytics. So it lets you go back in later and see exactly um, where your users drop out of your interview, perhaps. You want to see, like, watch the screen that's causing them to drop out and not to finish the interview. It helps in translation. This is something that some of you may or may not have had a chance to play around with, a new feature that Jonathan built really for our uh, eviction tool at Greater Boston Services is this translation system that, that really um, works a lot better when you tag all of your questions. And it helps a lot in debugging for the same reason as well, so you can look at the source and see exactly which question led to which problem. One thing that we've done is we've written a small module um, on some other consulting work that I'm doing that will display that ID when the interview is running in debug mode. So that lets you have testers write notes and see exactly which screen it is without having to kind of display, describe to you what the screen looks like and actually say, oh, it's the question with ID tag number XYZ. And you can jump right back in and know exactly where they were having, uh, where the feedback they're talking about applies to your Standards. The nice thing about standards, there's so many of them to choose from. There's one you should choose. This is something that we've been working on with um, some folks in Boston, and I know that um, Matt Newstead has a project that is looking so the right people are learning today <laughs> to help you figure out if that's going to um, end up happening. So this is what the standards look like right now. Try joining that again. Okay, so um, here are the dot symbol standards right now. These are available on GitHub. It's just in the very early stages. So you can see here um, what, what we've been working on, what we've been thinking about in terms of standards. 
So the first level of it is just like what are the things that you need to collect? And these are very heavily influenced by what we're doing in legal aid, which is most of the work that I'm doing is in the nonprofit sector. So um, things like what kinds of uh, information about people do we need to collect? What kind of information about household members do we need to collect? And when you have a common language that lets everyone work together to do the same thing, you can write questions that are, um, you only have to write a question once, and then you can reuse it across different sets. Um, we started to think about things like attributes of those people as well that you might have that are, are not built into DocAssemble, but you want to choose the same language to use to talk about those. So this is the very beginning of kind of the coding style, and I think that what we have, if people are familiar with Python, should someday look a little bit more like a pet eight, right? So that we have people don't have to make those choices from the, from scratch about what their interviews are going to be designed. You have that twenty percent that's really common across every interview. Let's start from from that. So when we're when we're working together, we all have a shared language for how those are done, and you don't have to kind of invent the right way to do it every time. Just if you are interested in this topic and you're on the back simple slide, you can join the structuring Python code channel. It's not active right this minute, but there's some history there and you can contribute for your ideas and stuff. Something that people ask me about, because I've been leading a workshop at Boston that you're also free to join. Um, remotely via Zoom is this is a question that comes up there sometimes is well how do I know when to divide my interview file into multiple files? So this is something I find about a lot. I went through at one point in time the eviction defense tool that I mentioned, we had like 30 files. And at one point we had one. And um, I've kind of gone back to thinking the right answer is close something closer to one. So I'm just gonna help you think through some of the things you want to keep in mind. Did anyone think about like why you want a separate interview file? I'm just curious, like what are some reasons people have run into this topic and thought about it? Perspective. Is it a layman or is it an attorney? So I'm thinking about when you're in the playground, you have multiple YAML files. So that really just would be as a program. When you might break your code into multiple files. <laughs> Or yeah, you could think of it, you could do it by topic for sure. You can think about like different, have a separate file for each topic. That was the one we wrote, so that's why I ended up with 30. It was more maintainable. There's some questions about maintainability, right? Yeah. So I mean, like, there are a couple of things, couple of reasons. I think some of those are, are going to be really good. I think a few more you think about is, is your question going to be used more than once in multiple interviews? If so, it should be its own file. So it's really easy for you to import it and include it into your content in the right um, One of the major reasons was translation. So there's two translation methods. I think the new method, it so far is working a lot better for us. And you don't need to separate files to, to use the new system of translation. Another is multiple simultaneous authors. So we have two people working on the same overall project. They um, probably don't want to be working on the same file at the same time. It's, it's going to be harder to manage who's making which. <laughs> Another reason might be the interview file is just a little bit too long. So this isn't really a huge topic. I think it's something to keep in mind. Um, it's generally better to start with one, and as the project grows, you might separate out separate more interview files. But I think that you should keep that one interview file that has the overall skeleton of the project, and. Um, Another related topic to that is, at one point, I played around with keeping all of the code, all of the um, Python code in its own file separate from the questions. I've kind of moved back to keeping related code next to the question that it touches on. So it just makes it easier for you to find topics when you're navigating the interview file. This isn't a huge thing. I think the main thing you want to keep in mind is you can always take advantage of the search function. So the exact order of your questions and your code in your interview file should not be that important, but just 
keep it in mind when you're organizing it so that you can make use of it later. Which editor should we use? So you can use the playground. That works well. Um, it's really iterative. You can work quickly and see your changes right away. But I think that there are some other choices that you should use once you get into the larger interviews. Here are four popular choices. There's three I recommend. I can't in good conscience recommend that you use Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a VI person, but actually I'm not anymore. Right now my most my, my favorite editor is VS Code. So um, for those of you who are familiar, Emacs and Venmo are two um, kind of uh, console mode editors, and I don't think there's a good reason to, to inflict that on yourself, unless you're confined to a little SSH. If you have other options, that use the full screen and have menus, a lot of those work pretty well. So VS Code is one I recommend. These are, um, in order of <laughs> in order of usability, I think VS Code is right now at the top. And there's going to be a lot of resources for it. Adam's another very popular editor. Um, Notepad Plus Plus is a very simple editor that you can jump in and understand right away. Everything's available from the menu, but it has a little bit fewer features than VS Code can have. And I think learning curve is not too bad for those. Yeah. One, one thing that helped me was how using like a YAML link. Um, so if the text like exactly yeah. Yeah. yes. Does VS Code support that? So yes, that's exactly why you want to use an external editor. Because the um, editor built into the playground is pretty good. It has some, some basic um, highlighting that will help tell you about some kinds of errors. But VS Code or, or, or Atom or, or Emacs or Vim, and the Emacs, I think, has a whole operating system built into it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it definitely has a linter. And um, you're going to have things like, like auto completion. Um, you're going to have errors flagged, especially with Python. So that's what I'm going to, to say that. Like if you're working in a, a Python module, you're going to get better error checking right now. But if actually you're talking about what are things that could contribute to the DocAssemble community, I think having a better linter that understands DocAssemble flavored YAML would be an amazing addition. I would say yes, code would be a good place to put it. <laughs> But there's a lot of editors, and I think um, having one that can show the way and then can be a model for other. What, what do you think is the way? You use that as an editor of Sublime? Oh, Sublime's not a really long one. Yes, I would say that is kind of the same category of um, VS Code. Very similar. Anyone else using PyCharm? Just curious. PyCharm is a, a super popular editor for Python. I mean, it's just the default one. Um, yeah, I just have gotten used to using yeah. yes, code. That's really the main reason. Shoot, try them, and know that they exist, and see what you like. But I don't know how it handles YAML. Do you know? Um, you got a plugin it, for it. It does. There's a YAML plugin for Python. Because it, it uses the same one as the, the rest of all the JetBrains um, IDEs that we can use. This, so you can share functions between them. So um, I'll just show you like a little bit about why I think you should try this. So here's the playground. This is a screenshot of my actual laptop screen with the playground. You can see, you can see about 16 lines of code. You do this nice sidebar, and you get the example blocks and source. Um, here's the same file, um, and same zoom on my laptop in VS Code. So I can see like 37 lines of code. Obviously, you can see a lot more of the file at once. It's easier for you to manage. One of the big things that um, people run into really early is working on, if you take that approach of having one code block that controls the flow of your interview, you're going to be lying to run back and forth between the top of the file where you have the order of the interview and the question that you're working on at that minute. Um, so any editor that, that has come up in this conversation is going to allow you to do something like this split screen view, where you have the same file open and you can see two different parts of it. You also have things like code folding, which actually I didn't have a demo of here. I can show you um, in a pretty long time, I think. There's just a, a ton of navigation features that are really helpful. 
in a full feature editor that you might really enjoy. So, let's go to a Python file. Python, again, like I said, has kind of the best limiting. But um, say you want to <coughs> come through, you see it, you have a, a giant function or class definition. Like this one here, which is just a, a list of options that I'm importing into the file. Code folding is just that. Like, so you can click on a plus or minus button and hide the part you don't care about. Um, the, the syntax highlighting is a little bit cleaner. All of these editors can generally be themed, so if you don't like the light on dark, you can switch it so it's dark on light. Some people that work in Boston do that. Let me jump back to the slides here. You also have things like search and replace. That's currently not part of the, like, or maybe something that would be worth thinking about adding at some point. It's a pretty um, useful feature, of course. And you have things like, this is a step beyond Lindsay. So, Lindsay, so for those of you who are, I know we're going over some like complex topics right now, but linting just means like kind of highlighting errors for you as you're editing. So you can see that you are creating correct code as you are. And this is something called, um, what is it actually, sorry, uh, IntelliSense, which lets you see as you start typing, it suggests the, the rest of the word for you. So I started typing a Python method called has attribute. It, it can guess when I've already typed, that's when I went back to type. And then it shows me the definition of the function right as I'm typing. That lets me see what's the next thing I should type in, which, what's the order of the, of the arguments of the function. So, all reasons to think about trying a different editor besides the one built into the playground. Um, one thing that you can do. If this is your workflow and you've integrated Google Drive or um, the OneDrive integrations are turned on, there's the sync and run button. Again, suggested by uh, a DocAssemble community member, Jason Morris, who I work with, uh, that lets you sync from the playground into the playground from your Google Drive. So you can be working locally in VS Code or whatever your favorite editor is. Your changes are going to be running live. You can still get that feedback loop of Made a change, now I want to see what it does right away. Right. Again, dense, I'm going to go through it, and um, the, the links in the slides will like, kind of see some more examples on your own too. So, object oriented programming, what is it? Anybody have a lot about what that is? And it's okay if, you're, if you think you're a ringer, I'm just curious to like, know what people have thought about. What, like the solid principles or what the one? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just talk about like from a usability point of view. Like, what are you really doing? So, um, objects are things in the world, and object-oriented programming lets you play with your code like you're interacting with objects. You don't have to know what's inside your apple to be able to eat it and digest it. You don't have to know um, what's behind the button. You press it and it does something. So it's a way to encapsulate code so it, it kind of acts a little bit like um, you don't have to know the internal workings of it. Using, so uh, .assemble, whether you know it or not, is very heavily object-oriented. And when you make use of the object-oriented features, you can make your code more readable. You can use some of the .assemble shortcuts and advanced features, things that, I'll go over those in just a minute, what some of those are. Make it easier to make your code more readable and modular and reusable. You can simplify your interviews, so you can have a lot less code than when you're using the object oriented functions. And getting back to a topic about code style, you're going to be writing more idiomatic, meaning more like what other people's code should be in your interview files. The class is something that you create once and then you can use it again. So if you define something like a person, which .symbol has built in, person has attributes like an address, a name, Birthday. You have to. You can think about that whole class of things that are in a person, and you do it once. And then every interview that you write from now on to the end of time will have those same kinds of features and ideas about how a person works. You can build iteratively, so you're not just starting with. Let's say you started with the name class, which is exactly how it works. About example, you have a name that has a first name, middle name, 
the last name and suffix, potentially other things that you have. It's put out like only that um, the um, English speaking world here. But then you can combine your name object into a person object, throw in an address object in there as well. Those things can build up over time, and you never have to, to worry about how the name object is implemented if you want to implement it. You can connect it to your person object. You don't have to worry about how the address object is implemented if you want to connect it. Either you can just keep building up and up. So, like, it, I, I like to use the example of a toaster, which is simple, right? You put in the bread and push the button, out of this toaster. Think about having your code work the same way. Someone else has made a module that you can import into your, your code that's object oriented. You don't have to worry about the details of how the toaster works. One toaster uses electricity, one toaster maybe uses a gas flame. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can switch them out and your know, code will work the same. So think about like this as building the ladder of your code up. Um, when, you, when you've done the work one time, that's going to be shared across 10 or 20 or a dozen interviews, and it will still work for you um, without you having to remember how you, how you got to the first step. If you've worked in other kinds of expert systems, you've probably gone back and like changed your code and, and copied it and pasted it and, and tried to see like what could you to avoid having to do this from scratch this time. But when you're using objects, you're not having to like remember the implementation details. So like I've done like working objects, for example, like you're, you're doing search and replace all over in order to try to reuse it. In um, when you use object oriented approaches, you don't have to, to do that. Never have to move the implementation details because it's built from the ground up to be reusable. Here are the key objects that are built into DocAssemble. And I'm using object and class interchangeably, and I, I think that's fine. Like you, you shouldn't be too overly worried about that difference here. Um, these are, if you understand what these classes are, I think, then you'll be able to build and take advantage of all the features that I just talked about. If you do decide to get in a little bit more detail, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like too. But so I, so I said early on, using classes will let you save time and use DocSymbol's advanced features. If you haven't already used these, things like the send email and send SMS functions, those work with people. So you, you collect with a person and you use the DocSymbol class for an individual. You can send an email to an individual. You never have to worry about which field has the email address where you don't have to track the million variables. It's just you're tracking the person. You do things like the, the map of function that works with addresses or people that have addresses built in. That creates a JavaScript map that you can see where people uh, you can put locations on the map. Things like pronouns and age functions. If you've written a template, again, hot docs, you're, you're making a million little components to try to make it simpler to track he versus she versus they. In DocAssemble, if you use a person object and it has a gender, it automatically can do things like make the pronouns match. You can do things like matching collective and singular nouns correctly. So get familiar with those, get to learn a little bit what they are. They're not as scary as it seems once you get a hand, hand, handle on them. And it can really help you write cleaner and leader code, both in templates and in. So is it worth using classes? I think yes. They're not necessarily easy. There's a lot to dive into. I did write a little um, blog post, which I think could help you get started with the big concepts. That goes into a lot more depth in this little section of the presentation that does. I'm going to throw these out there, and I think a lot of you here have not yet gotten to the point where you're writing classes, but here's a pattern, and it can be very, very simple, but I use again and again in my interviews. So I create something that extends the DA object. So that might be, for example, in my income class, there's an object that, is, there's a class that extends the DA object, which represents an asset. And then the next thing I'm doing is I'm collecting more than one of those. So I add it to a DA list. That's the pattern you use again and again. Collecting, an object that's very simple, it just has three or four attributes. But then once you add it to the list, you can do things like have a method that totals it. So you don't have to write the code every time to loop through the list and do the total and you've done it in one place and something 
use them again without having to remember the logic of how you set up your infrastructure. A lot of early .assemble developers, once they learn about collecting data, they're going to use things like dictionaries and kind of do all that stuff manually. Take the leap to learn about classes. You can do it once in the background, and it's going to be in a reusable way for you. So that's one pattern. The second pattern that I use a lot is the API query object. So again, you're encapsulating some of the logic in a class that makes it easier to access and reuse. Take a, um, an API like Microsoft Graph, which lets you access a, a million things from SharePoint to um, OneDrive, um, Outlook. I want to be able to access that in my box of interviews. And um, I didn't want to have to remember all of the graph API code every time that I was using it in the interview file. So I put it in the class. It's very simple. Um, it store, it, it, the first thing it does is it gets the doc assembly configuration to try to get my API key. So that's stored in the object. Then, then I wrote a simple function which lets me get each type of item that I actually want to use in my interview in a way that's useful in the interview. Maybe there's a setter, like maybe you can add um, a new entry to a SharePoint library of a new file that you upload. But I've only implemented the ones that I needed right away, so it's like maybe five of those things that I mentioned in SharePoint maybe are available. And over time, I'm going to add more of those to the API as I need them. So that's basically it. I know, like I said, I know that's for you guys. Um, welcome to the questions and also for you to do a little bit more reading is available on the link in the slides. I have a question. Yeah. So could you explain what what Lemma Legal does and what you're available to do? Sure. I think you covered a little bit of it. Yeah, so what we do is dot symbol consulting. So what we're available for is anything from building interviews, and we're doing a number of those in the legal aid context right now, um, to building custom integrations, things like the API integration I talked about for Microsoft Graph. So when, if you need help with, with um, anything related to Docsum, it's something that we can do. We're open to people looking for hosting needs, um, something to figure out. It's kind of a thing that's easier with scale. We're not doing very much of it yet, but we'd love to be able to help Absolutely. Yes. Do you uh, have you had an opportunity to build into WooCommerce or WordPress? Yeah. Uh, well, so John actually built a WordPress integration. Did you mean just to embed an interview in WordPress? No, more like there's a sale online and get that data. Okay, that sounds very doable. Um, a lot of so Python has this library built into it called Quest, which makes it really easy to work with APIs. The main thing you want to do is just clean it up a little bit and um, a little bit of the front end on it with a class. Like I was just giving an example of Microsoft Graph. So I would imagine that's something you can do. That's like the thing I like about that symbol is you can integrate whatever you want. It's always. We've actually built an integration from WooCommerce and WordPress into. Um, through the auth o integration. So that might be another option. Yeah, or OAuth, I think it's called. But then we use the third party service called auth, o, auth Zero to connect the two. Right, so that's something that um, Jonathan just built the OAuth integration, so that's available for anybody to use. And that's the main way of kind of this workflow of you approve someone to get access to your other service. like. Drive or whatever it might be. So you can have a workflow where clients authorize you access to their third party API. Yeah, so there are a couple ways that OAuth is integrated into DocAssemble. One is through the user logging. You can have username and password, or you can have third party authentication. And one of the ways you can do third party authentication is the Auth0. Uh, service, which is like a general signing service, but you can also do Facebook and Twitter, uh, Google, things like that. Uh, and then what Quinn was talking about was recently I created a, just like an object for handling um, a lot of authentication. So if in the middle of an interview, you wanted to have the user 
uh, consent to share their you know, Google Sheets with you or something like that. Uh, you could you can have that that authentication process take place in the middle of your interview. And so I think Clinton might be the first to actually use that. Um, but that that's pretty powerful for any type of third party integrations that uh, we might we might want to create in the future. Uh, I think the general rule is use the best tool for the job. So there are a lot of features that I haven't yet put into Doc Center just because you know, there, there's already some really great powerful tool out there that you can pay you know, a dollar a day for. So you might as well use the best in class feature and then just integrate it. Uh, so, so that opens up the opportunity to use some of that in your interviews. Is that any uh, OAuth provider or is that just a hot zero that, that? It can be any OAuth provider. Oh. Pretty flexible. Scopian, yeah. so, who's written a docs in the language before? Okay. And who's just interested in it? Yeah. Okay. You know, um, when I initially encountered Doc Symbol, I um, found your stuff. Okay. Then I tracked back to home. A lot of what you had, I, that's how I chose to have a droplet, how I decided to implement, do the things I did. Um, I would suggest in your stuff, and this might be outside of your purview, um, just going back in the, the covering it on the SSL. Um, I noticed earlier in one of the presentations the same thing. That's one of the things that's really it's it's difficult as a user. Like I was able to come back oh, in, okay. I was able to attach the domain name, I was able to do certain things, but securing the site isn't yes. is readily um, it's not as easy, you know, as some of the other things. And so, you know, I thought your stuff and Jonathan's, like, things in general, the whole thing going through that stuff was amazingly documented. That was one of the things that I really felt like, you know, the documentation was somewhat lacking on. You know, yes, everybody's yes. like, and some of it is, I understand that, you know, there might be a reluctance to push people towards a particular platform, you know, or server industry versus. Um, you know, doing some of the other stuff, but I think that's one of the places where a beginner can really get screwed up is figuring out how to do a domain name or even non beginners, right? That's well, putting the, 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 the domain wasn't so difficult. There was documentation, I don't know if I got it from you or elsewhere, but just um, securing the container, it was, it, was, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it would have been, you yeah. know. And so, you know, I would say in your stuff, if that's something I think is great. Yeah, it's I don't know why yeah, I thought it was amazing. It's going to be a topic for a historian here, right? Yeah. Well, I will just call out, like, so we've got a green of here who helped, right? Name of the tutorial that you found first. Um, okay. All right, somebody else asked a question, Clinton, because we, we need to solve a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to force you to ask a question. All right, yeah, Alice. On your website, you suggest uh, DigitalOcean? As opposed to Amazon Web Services, which I find is really expensive, mm -hmm. and I've had trouble setting up an S3 bucket or a bucket for one digital services. They have space, uh, space. Uh, they have a blob storage type of service, but I, I have trouble yeah. connecting. Um, do you have any suggestions? Because I prefer not to pay Amazon Web Services prices. It's They're also fair. Slow. Okay, so what I've I've changed some of my minds, <laughs> which I did. It's a great. Point, I'd have to go back and update some things. In a, a year, a lot changes. So, um, AWS released something called Amazon Lifescale, which is a fixed price service. So, so I've actually been using that lately. Um, I found the newest release of that was no longer works in the $10 range, so it's lively. Um, on any of the services, you really need four, megabyte, four gigabytes of RAM. So, Lifescale, $20 a month, same price as the ocean. And I use S3. And it's easier to connect it because it's all on your <laughs> Azure works well too. Um, Azure is just like way more expensive, so <laughs> they don't have a fixed price thing. You like Sailor. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is like there's a path for you to use S3 or Azure Blocks. There's not one for yeah. whatever Google has. So stick with the well tried path. And if you're a non profit, you can get Microsoft and Azure stuff. Uh, or basically free if you get a really big ten thousand dollars a year. Well, it's down to three thousand. Oh, that's so, not down to three thousand. You should still you get a lot pretty quickly. Is what I found, yeah. I found out. But it's still worth it. I mean, Amazon. They have some good tools for Microsoft Windows stuff. So. 
Yes. That's what I was going to say. You get a really good deal on Azure if you're a nonprofit. I think you have to like tech suit. Yeah, something okay. like yeah. that. And, um, but it dropped down. It dropped down to 3500 a year. Oh, 3500 um, You can also buy AWS prepaid. So if you buy $300 through TechSoup, you can get um, AWS for, I think, five. Is it a, someone help me. Is it $3,000 or $5,000? It's around, it's around $5,000. So you can prepay for that up front if you're going to use more than $300. It's a pretty good deal, too. For so earlier you said you were running code blocks um, in your interviews. So you don't have like a separate Python library file or anything like that? So code blocks that do things like set variables in the interview, and then I use a module for anything that's going to be more abstract. That's so not in any specific. So you're not recommending our like, functions or no, keep your functions and your classes in a module file. But there's going to be some code, like, let's say you're asking the person for a date, and you want to do some date math for it about that variable. I think that's an example. I think that's a real one. Um, I, I put that inside the interview, and it's, it's in a standalone code block. And for a while, they were having all the code blocks in a separate YAML. But I've realized it's just easier organization to keep it related to the question, in the closest question that asks for the information. So if I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to hot dots as an example, I'm sure some people here have used hot dots. You can have code right in the dialogue or something in script block. We think that we go to script block like that, I just have right below the question. That kind of, that's the kind of thing that I mean. Yes. I was that guy who always asked dumb questions in law school, so. There's no dumb questions. I'm sorry if this yet. Uh, I know this is like some dead stuff, so. You know, as for going through where I'm writing something, and then I think to myself, crap, I need a note that block. You know, crap, every state has different code repositories. Surely somebody has written a function that does code reports, you know, and so it makes me wonder is there, do you, or do you use, or is there somewhere that's it's just like a repository of cool functions and stuff like that that people share or, or use that I'm not aware of. That's, that's it. That's it. Well, there's GitHub. This is what I'm going to show you. So GitHub does have a search function. Um, so if you search for docassemble dash, you're going to find things that people have published on GitHub. I'm looking in the wrong place and save. Well, that's, that thing. was the idea uh, of DocuSumble from the beginning was that there would be um, really user-friendly functions that attorneys could use that just said, create a cache or create a notary block. And sort of using the magic of, of object-oriented programming, you would figure out the jurisdiction and format it appropriately for the, for the context. Um, but that does require a lot of work by the community to sort of build that out. And I haven't yet done that, and, but it, it is on my to-do list so, to create some very help, just some sort of legal-specific helper functions to do common things like that. It's a, I, you know, we get it. Yeah, we get it. so we can take what you did. And, well, happy to contribute to it, yeah. but I certainly, you know, it's shit called part of <laughs> You know, it, so there's a little bit of an embarrassment by publishing yeah. that, but you know, we'd be happy to do it, you know, but I don't know how or the number right. of the mail call that is that I could put in there to say mail call that is, you know, yeah. my crack the code because I'm not in that country for a piece of Fine. So that's something to, um, yeah, this is like a good topic too. To like, put this in the like, how do I share my code that I just wrote with the rest of the community? Because I can write a little bit more sometimes. Have an air table going with all the doc assemble interviews, which is being just pulled from GitHub. And those sorts of things. Um, you go to hub.clerical.ai. Um, what did you say hub.clerical.ai? Hub um, it's just a, that's just a, it'll redirect you to a uh, Airtable that lists all the doc sample interviews that I've, I need to script this, but I've done some manual curation with it as well, which is part of duplicates or negative like, people that understand how GitHub works and they ask me to take stuff down because they have something helpful with those who GitHub. So, um, that's it. Um, 
Yeah, so in the future, you could browse Everett's uh, lib Airtable list and, and see what packages people have created to provide nice helper functions for people. Um, um, for sort of templates or the, like the MOs or whatever you have your system generating, what's the preferred template? Is it Word or is it Markdown? Because it sort of seems like Markdown might be the preferred one just because it runs faster. But um, do you guys have any thoughts on I, so, I mean, I've seen a lot of questions on the slide lately about it, trying to force Markdown to be something that they kind of isn't. So, it's not a language for highly styled documents. It's just not going to do that. You can try to force it with like LaTeX modules. So I, I use Microsoft Word. That is because people do demand highly styled documents. I think you can't, just like you can't auto generate a usable interview, you can't re rely on auto generated for. Uh, of a formatted documents to have a style in. Have you guys ever tried doing like a recursive reference? So like you have a, a Word document and then you have like sub Word documents you want to include them multiple times? Yep. Have you been able to get that to work? Yeah, so I use um, so one approach you take the notary block would be just to create a Word file that is just the notary block. With some standard variables, and here's where the bare I am standards come into the same problem. Okay, because I use it extensively for captions and signature blocks. So I've written those ones, and they're pretty, they're standardized. They have like a place for the court name to go. With it. Work for one or no? So it's multiple levels of inclusion that you're talking about. Maybe that's a limit of how it works. I think it should work. As long as you know, what I do is like you send variables instead, but so. Yeah, I think that the thing you're talking about could, could be done with a uh, sub document uh, if you do it the right way. But yeah, I mean, the problem is that includes another sub document or a sub document that's included multiple times. Yeah, it should all work. Oh, yeah, that, I do that for sure. Yeah, I, I have like a signature block. I have a multi page document with multiple signatures. I include it as many times as it's needed. And the trick is to use um, set. And actually, I think Jonathan, you created that function because I asked yeah, for that exact yeah. purpose. You gotta get a variable in the right way. That should work. And if you have any problems, uh, post it on the question channel on Slack. <laughs> 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 it's like the syllabus. Okay. Yeah, that's, I was gonna say, I think Jenga has sort of a company too where they can really use modeling components hmm. within Jenga. Uh, so you can set up, you can have Jenga have a, a standard and then reuse. Notary block, for instance, it's a notary template uh, that would have all the formatting that was already set up already. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I think she used, there are some really advanced features in the Jinja template company that I could not take with pencil. We're coming to lunch now, right? Yeah, thank you.